live from the Holy Land. It is Is It Prophecy with Ari Lewis, and uh, we're here on the program. We are very excited to everyone here. You know, it's interesting because my first show that we had on was Ken Spiro, Rabbi Ken Spiro, an historian, and we were talking about the Four Blood Moons, which is a book written by Pastor John Hagee, and it's a concept that there are four blood moons within a two-year period, one over Pesach, which last last Passover coming up, one over Sukkot, the next Passover, the next Sukkot, and one of those things mean, and that that occurred in 1968, 1969, and also 1948, 1949 when we had wars. So the prediction was way back then that there would be a war in the next uh, two-year cycle of this uh, blood moon thing, if you will, year and a half cycle, and that prophecy has been fulfilled. Uh, also, of course, there is the Red Heifer, which is about uh, six months old, as we learned last week with Rabbi Chaim Richman. And the Red Heifer, the Red Cow, is part of the concept of when Mashiach comes, that he uses the Red Heifer. Uh, the Red Heifer will be used in the temple, I should say, uh, to purify the people. And the Red Heifer has to be two years old for that. So we are definitely in interesting times. Uh, is it close to Mashiach or is it not? Uh, it feels like it is, but obviously it's felt like that before. And uh, the war that we're at right now, is it a sign of Gogo Magog or is it not? And what is Gogo Magog? And we're going to try to get into those things uh, later on with my guest, Rabbi Hoffman of the Raven Institute in Baltimore. We'll have him on in a few minutes. And before we uh, read some of the news stories, I just want to talk about uh, this show a little bit. Uh, we're being simulcast as the Mashiach Hour, so if you go to... Uh, messiahhour.blogspot.co.il you can check out uh, all the programs we're going to podcast everything so you'll be able to hear it there and uh, we set up a youtube channel so again messiahhour.blogspot.co.il and you can email me at messiahhour at gmail.com and let me tell you kind of my dreams my goals for the show and what we're trying to look at uh basically what I want is what I'm trying to get our sponsorship because right now, as you guys know, the fans know, I do the show only one hour a week. Um, I would like to do it more. My goal would be to do it three hours a day, five days a week. But for that to happen, we need funds. Uh, we need funds for equipment. We need funds for staff to do more research and assistant work because uh, right now I do everything as far as getting guests, as far as the research of the programming. And then we have a great technical staff. But uh, I need more funds to do the show three hours a day, five days a week. And I feel that if we are close, uh, again, I'm not saying if, that we are for sure, but I would like to speed things up and do more shows. So if uh, anyone out there knows how I can get uh, sponsorship or how I can be a sponsor, et cetera, get a sponsor, uh, you can email me at messiahhour at gmail.com. Again, messiahhour at gmail.com. Uh, just to read the news before being on Rabbi Hoffman, of course, uh, if you guys don't know, we did go into Gaza last time. When I say we, I mean the Israeli Defense Force. And the ministers, a lot of uh, the, ca the cabinet of Israel, are actually supporting uh, Bibi's decision. And it's uh, interesting that there is a unification in that front. Uh, Minister Naftali Bennett said Hamas left us no choice. Uh, here is uh, the news article. Cabinet ministers from the right and left expressed their support on Thursday night for Israel's ground operation in Gaza. Communications Minister Gilad Erdan from Likud said in an interview on Channel 2 News that a decision to expand Operation Protective Edge into a ground assault was reached unanimously among the entire cabinet. That's very significant that it was a unanimous uh, decision. We don't always uh, see that, but we did see that this time with the ground attack. And another story, uh, Hamas chief declares that Israel's ground operation in Gaza is destined to fail. Um, Hamas chief Khalad Mashal said on Thursday night that Israel's ground operation in Gaza was destined to fail in remarks to AFP in the Qatari capital. Quote, what the occupier Israel failed to achieve through its air and sea raids, it will not be able to achieve with the ground offensive. It is bound to fail, Mashal directed from his exile in Doha. He further said Hamas has, quote, clear demands, including an end to, quote, the aggression and collective punishment against our people, as well as the lifting of the Gaza siege. So that's what uh, the thoughts are on Hamas. And uh, last uh, story that we'll read before we bring on our guest, why you grants tenure to eight faculty members. Kind of a nice little story that's not related to the war, something to 
calm our minds a bit. Yeshiva University grants tenure to eight faculty members in fields ranging from art history to mathematics and GIX studies. Yeshiva University on Thursday announced that it has granted tenure to eight faculty members from across its undergraduate and graduate schools in fields ranging from art history, mathematics, and genetic studies. Quote, after an arduous review, these new tenured professors join an outstanding faculty who testify to the quality of Yeshiva University, said Dr. Selma Bowman, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at YU. So those are some of the top news stories. If you want to read more news stories, Go to IsraelNationalNews.com and click on News, and we have all the latest stories possible. So, uh, in fact, the story about the ministers expressing their support for the ground operation in Gaza, that was uh, written a few minutes ago, actually. That's how up-to-date we are on uh, the whole situation. So we're very excited to uh, have you joining us. And what we're going to do, again, is, as I mentioned – is that we're going to be talking about this war, and we're going to be talking about if it uh, looks like it'll be a final war, or if this is kind of just life in Israel. If you look at the numbers, basically there's a war every two years. I mean, again, it's how do you define a war, but uh, you know, it's part of it, life in Israel, going into the bomb shelters, hearing the sirens, especially in, in the south. I mean, they have rockets all the time, and um, again, uh, that's kind of that's kind of the way it is. Is that we are living in war times, and that's uh, so that's kind of the way it is. And uh, basically, we have to decide if the, or we have to look into this if that this is the final war or not. Um, and we'll try to talk what we can. I mean, obviously, we're not prophets. So the show is called Is a Prophecy, but that doesn't mean that we can say for sure. We're going to try to look into things, the way this battle could escalate, if this could be the final one or not. I mean, we had uh, Rabbi David Katz last week. He seems to think more that the that there is uh, a possibility that this could be the final one based on uh, quotes he used uh, regarding Tehillim. And if you want to check out that show, again, that is – Cy Hour. Uh, on the line right now from the Raven Institute in Baltimore is Rabbi Hoffman. Rabbi, can you hear us? Ari Lewis. How are you? I'm, I'm doing great, and it's uh, great to have you on, obviously. So let's first talk about uh, the American media's perception of, of this war and how that could escalate things, because uh, we spoke off the air, and you were of the thinking that the media is actually escalating this war. Give us your thoughts on that matter. There is no doubt. There is definitely going on right now a media battle. This has happened ever since these kids um, passed away. The three on the on the Israeli side and the. Uh, Palestinian child that was unfortunately killed, uh, which on one hand uh, was the spark that led to this situation. Of course, um, over here, people do realize um, that this is a, a conflict that continues to show its hand every, every couple of years or so. There's just different moving parts each time. But this time around, there is such a heavy, heavy part in the social media where this has almost become a, a media war uh, between opinions, opinions on the so-called left, the so-called right. Um, this is one of the problems that I've personally seen is that people all have to be considered left if they're you know, quote unquote, anti-Israel, which a lot of people are not. A lot of people just uh, have opinions that are against uh, possibly what Israel is doing here. Um, I'm personally in the camp where, you know, Israel, it goes without saying, I'm almost sick and tired personally of hearing this, this repeated line of a country having the right to defend itself. Of course, a country has a right to defend itself. If Israel doesn't defend itself, it's going to perish. 
uh, a lot of people uh, believe in the United States, and a lot of people believe in Israel, that if the uh, population there in Gaza, if the terrorists were to put their weapons down, there would be no war. And if the Israelis put their weapons down, the state of Israel would be finished. All right. So that is, of course, one of uh, Bibi's uh, famous quotes. Uh, but in regards to the media, and I want to explain why this is significant, because when you talk about Gog and Magog, there are different prophecies of countries lining up against Israel. And right now, the United States is Israel's best ally, even with uh, the current administration, even with uh, certain, certain comments made. I mean, the fact of the matter is, America paid for Israel's Iron Dome, and that's why the Iron Dome, that's part of the reason we've done so well in this war is because of the Iron Dome, and Bibi even thanked the people of the United States for paying that on Meet the Press. So if America's support goes away, Israel could be in serious trouble, and that could happen as a result of the media. So talk about that. Let's go to the John Stewart thing, Rabbi. I don't know if you saw that or not, but John Stewart, fellow Jew, very critical of Israel in his show, Daily Show on Comedy Central. Uh, talk about that piece, because he is a huge member of the media, and he has a lot of influence. So uh, did you get a chance to see that uh, piece, Rabbi? Well, I actually uh, last night saw the Hillary Clinton uh, part of the interview where okay. he, um, you know, I personally actually have been uh, an opponent, uh, you know, against the views of, of Hillary Clinton as they've mirrored the views of the current administration, which in my mind has had some of the worst anti, not anti-Israel, but but uh, because the United States is pro-Israel naturally, or so they say, but I have heard tougher rhetoric coming not only from the media, like you say, but from the administration of the United States. But as far as John Stewart goes, um, I don't take that to be credible. You know, John Stewart is a businessman, is a comedian. He will cater to the to the left side of things, uh, to a crowd, which will, you know, always see, you know, sort of this quote unquote moral equivalency that's going on too much of a obsession on the quote unquote brutal situation of the civilians, uh, in Gaza. Right. He is clearly to the left. I mean, he might try to paint himself as more centrist or a little left of centrist, but he's very left. But this is very symbolic because he is a Jew, and the fact that he's critical of Israel, I'm concerned this is a representation of Jews in America, some of them, that are also critical of Israel. Because ironically, right now, I mean, I'm just calling it like it is, people, uh, there are a lot of Christian fundamentalists, Christian evangelicals that are evangelicals, that are much more supportive of Israel than Jewish people in America. I want you to talk a bit about that because, again, this could all be a key to setting up uh, the final war. If the Jewish people in America are not going to support Israel, well, then why would America continue to support Israel unless the evangelicals are so strong in helping us? So talk a bit about the Jewish mindset in the United States. Well, how, how amazing is it that uh... – we live in a day and age in which the evangelical support is arguably stronger than the support of many Jews that do not identify with the state of Israel. I'm not going to get into religious things. I personally have a lot of friends and family that are quote unquote reform and conservative Jews uh, that I believe are not necessarily tied in to the Jewish history, to the facts, will watch the shows like The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. And, um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate because it's the same kind of mentality as another situation we spoke about months back where another Jew, Donald Sterling, represented Judaism badly by calling uh, Jews to be racist to in Israel be considering black people to not be equal to be slaves to Jews in Israel in his dementia. You know, it's amazing how much the media can sway a person's mind. 
And we have to you know, remember that media and people's opinion are often politically laced, are often laced with a person's background, are often laced with where a person's mindset is. Again, you know, John Stewart, this is a business. This is money. He is going to – there is no money to be made in, in catering to the right. He does not represent Fox News. And so people have to realize that they have to do their own research. You know, I personally consider myself possibly on what people would consider to be the right side of things, but I read at least the half a dozen news sources every day, uh, some of which are all the way on the – again, on that quote-unquote left, and some of which are on the very right side. Okay, but Rabbi Hoffman, let me interrupt you here. You're saying there's no money to be made from Katie to right, but yeah, there is. There are rich Republicans. There are rich people on the right side. Why does Jon Stewart, as a businessman, have to just go for the left? I think there's something deeper. I think sometimes you have that self-hating Jew that's inside some of these Jews. I think it's more of that. I don't think it's just a money thing. No, you're you're right. It isn't. And um, I wouldn't go as far as to mention – you know, self-hating. But what I will mention is that there is a history of the Jewish people uh, being rather assimilative. You know, we want to naturally as a nation be very nice to a lot of people. So when we see, a, you know, a group of people who, again, you know, not being very well learned in an area, we see a group of people that are being tormented or, or you know, and, you know, we think, you know, people think that it's being done by the Israeli army, but really it's being done by by the leadership in Gaza. But they feel bad about that. You know, I was recently in uh, overseas in, in Europe, and, you know, it's also an assimilating culture where Jews want to be nice to everybody. And in being nice, they want to cater to this crowd that that uh of a of a muslim crowd and not not seem to depict themselves as a group of people that does you know what what people see to be bad things against a group of people in a humanitarian crisis and again what leads to these feelings are people not knowing the history people you know this is a very religious situation you know, there are a lot, there are in this world, you know, just in Israel, 80, 85% of Jews are not religious. Uh, in the United States, uh, that number is probably rather similar. Uh, and in the world, there's probably just a fraction of a small fraction of Jews that are religious. The reason I say religion is because ultimately in this situation, we come down to a story of religion versus politics. The two do not mix. And the reason I say religion is because religion is the reason why the Jews don't just pack up and go to another place in the world that doesn't have such a historical sensitivity to it. Jews want to stay in Israel because many of us believe that this is our natural homeland where the Jews need to be. That is a religious situation. And uh, there are Jews around the world, John Stewart included, that probably don't care about this. Well, it's also, if you look at these media members, it's very interesting how much, how many of them are Jewish, have Jewish blood. You have Bill Maher, who actually, ironically, he is very to the left, but he is pro-Israel. He is Jewish. You have David Gregory, Meet the Press. His father is Jewish. If you look on and on, uh, there are a lot of Jews that are involved with media, and that's why it's so ironic. That's why I want to talk about it, because this media could really uh, escalate things uh, with the war. You know, talking about religion and uh, a few more minutes before we go to our first break, uh, it's interesting that Ramadan is right now, and we had the 17th day of Tammuz a few days ago. That's the day that marks the Roman siege and the ending of the first uh, temple. So the religious factor as far as the Muslims are concerned, talk to me about that because this is a different enemy. Someone brought up this idea that with the Nazis, they kind of didn't really believe in a god, and they knew that their time was finite, and that there was a certain weakness there. With the Muslims, they believe that their concept, their idea is divine, 
and that there's and there's a billion Muslims, and that if they die in a suicide bombing, there'll be someone else to take it over. And you kill the Hamas leadership, then someone else takes over. So this is a different type of animal that we're dealing with uh, in this war. So talk a bit about that before we go to break. Reminds me of the Vietnam War, the reason 50,000 Americans lost their lives, unfortunately, in that situation. Another war that many in the United States did not want. We were dealing with guerrilla warfare. We are not dealing with a group of people that are in bunkers using guns. Uh, these people are using children as human shields, wives and mothers as human shields. They are keeping rockets. Yesterday, rockets were found in a school and actually taken out of the school by an international force. Um, these are very, not just guerrilla warfare tactics, but dealing with a group of people that actually almost want to die for the cause of, of martyrdom. There's an idea of martyrdom in all religions, but only the Islamic extremism seems to have a situation where they look to do this because they feel like it's their only way of, of actually getting somewhere. Funny that that's the case, and in other countries like France, you have what I consider these cowards. You know, They're very much on the outside and attacking synagogues. And, you know, the reason I say these kind of things is because there is no moral equivalency, as people claim. You know, there this, you know, again, unfortunate killing, which, you know, I personally still have my issues to think of whether, you know, these kids really did burn a Palestinian alive. Very hard for me to believe. Nothing like this has ever been exposed Uh you know, from from what I ever can remember, a situation like this, uh, real nutcases that represent less than not only a half of a percent, uh, not even a half uh, of a okay. percent. Yeah, okay, Rabbi Hoffman, we're going to go to break. Um, everyone stay tuned. We're going to talk about Iran on the other side. And again, this is Is It Prophecy on Israel National Radio. Thank you for joining us. Simon Cast on messiahhour.blogspot.co.il. Is It Prophecy with Ari Lewis. All right, back for part two of the program. Thanks for joining us. Is It Prophecy here on Israel National Radio. Of course, this show. Uh, is also simulcast on messiahhour.blogspot.co.il. Again, we're going to be putting up uh, all the shows up there. Giz, Bizrat Hashem. Again, messiahhour.blogspot.co.il. You can email me at messiahhour at gmail.com. And as I mentioned in the first part of the program, uh, we're looking for sponsors because we want to do this show three hours a day, five days a week. We are obviously living in a very intense time, so the more shows we can do, the better, the more funding we get the better, the more research we can do the better, more equipment, etc. So contact me, messiahhour at gmail.com and uh, tell us how you can help because we want to provide great programming to the public and to all the fans, of course. Now, in the first segment, we were talking about the media's influence on this current war with the Israelis and the Arabs and how that could actually make things worse and enhance this war in a very bad way. Also, American support, can that be affected by the media? Ironically, Jewish members of the media, such as Jon Stewart. But we're going to put that on the shelf just for a little bit to talk about Iran. BB on Meet the Press on Sunday talked about that Iran is building up their nuclear program. They are not doing it for any type of societal reasons. They're doing it for a nuclear bomb. That would certainly play into Goga Bagog. The opinions in the Talmud about the final war, if it's 12 seconds, 12 minutes, you could kind of see how that could be if there is a nuclear bomb and Iran has it. So we're back with Rabbi Hoffman. Rabbi, thank you again for joining us in the second segment. Thank you, Ari, for having me in the Holy Land. I appreciate it, buddy. Sure. So let's talk about Iran's nuclear program because they have a deadline coming up in which they are supposed to 
basically I th- dismantled their program or they're, they're in talks, and it looks like they're just going to stop with the talks. I don't think they're going to stop making that bomb. Uh, tell us uh, your thoughts about – some people say Iran is not a threat. Uh, some people say they are a significant threat. We all should be very concerned. So give us your thoughts on the matter. No doubt it's taking a uh, back seat to a lot of other things that have been popping up in the world lately, such as the Middle Eastern conflict going on in Israel, the situation going on with Russia and the Ukraine, and the plane that was shot down, Malaysia Airlines, and other situations that are going on in the world. Uh, And uh, not a a lot of people are talking about Iran, but, you know, nothing's changed. Uh, Israel very much believes that they're very much still in the midst of getting this nuclear material together, uh, just a certain amount away from actually having a nuclear warhead. And for anybody to think that they've took a a step back from all that, uh, absolutely not. There is more United States pressure right now on the government of Russia than there is on the government in Iran. I believe that's wrong. All right, let's talk about why that is. Is President Obama being incompetent? Is he being malicious? Why is there not more pressure on Iran? Well, some people believe it's because of uh, his possible ties to uh, to his people, if you know what I'm saying there. But uh, there are a lot of other situations which the United States possibly profits more off of uh, – looking at things that it believes are are more pertinent right now. Uh, The pertinent situation for the United States right now is the situation in Israel, and it's the situation in Russia. Uh, Why these these issues have, have more of an impact? It just has to do with news. It just has to do with news, and, and uh, it's unfortunate. So you're saying that there's a distraction going on, and then that's why the U.S. is taking its time and pressure on Iran with, the, with this nuclear warhead? Elaborate a little more about what you, what you just said. Well, the United States is very spread thin right now. You know, this is what happens when – when they try to police the entire world, you know, there's only so much, you know, a country can do at once, you know, and, and this also comes at the same time that the economy is having a lot of tough challenges. Right now, the administration is having a lot of, uh, is having its hands tied with a border crisis going on in the southern United States with immigrants coming in. Uh, it, uh, the Iranian situation is not making news. Yeah, and it's very ironic. It's a great point you bring up, Rabbi, because it certainly should be making news. Uh, again, I, what are your thoughts? I have a funny feeling that you don't think Iran is building up their nuclear program for electricity or lights in their buildings, as some people like to say. I think it's because they want to cause a lot of chaos. Yeah, I don't go by what people have to say. I go by legitimate threats. In 1967, the country of Egypt, for instance, which actually the country of Egypt right now is pro-Israel, destroying Hamas because it hates Hamas more than more than it hates Israel. But back in 67, Egypt said it was going to destroy Israel. Israel made a preeminent attack because it is a biblical, biblical right for Israel to attack the country first when it says when they say that, that Israel is going to be destroyed, that they kill those people before they kill Israel. And the same thing is, is happening with Iran. These are threats coming from Iran to destroy Israel, and Israel is going to take that seriously. And the United States decides not to take that seriously. You know, it goes back to what we were talking about in the last segment, Ari, which is like, who cares what people say and think Because at the end of the day, Israel is going to do what it thinks best, just like it took out Iraq's nuclear content in the 80s by itself unilaterally. And they will do the same thing once again. You know, this is not – you know, when it comes to people's lives, Pekuach Nefesh, 
life and death. We don't really listen to what comedians have to say, what the social media has to say. Are all these things very unfortunate? Yes. But at the end of the day, Israel will act on its threats very seriously, regardless of what the United States is doing in a political fashion. Well, it looks like that Bibi kept his word this time because he'd been threatened constantly for the past week and a half that they would send in ground troops uh, if the rocket fire did not stop from Gaza. But I want to argue with you, if I may, Rabbi, with all due respect about saying that Israel will ignore the world and the media if they have to do it. See, I'm not so sure. I mean, we we saw that last night, but it took them a while, and it, they have not always done this. They have to be concerned about the thoughts of the United States because the United States paid for that Iron Dome, because the United States gives $30 billion a year approximately. So if we were talking off air that Israel has to figure out a way to be more independent to try to deflect being concerned and having to be worried about what other countries think, correct? Absolutely. I mean, and this is why off air we've talked about what I believe to be a situation in which it's important for Israel and the United States to continue to be allies. However, if Israel wants to be a truly independent nation, just like a lot of other countries in the world have a right to be an independent nation, that uh, I'm actually on the side of a of a uh, politician in the United States, Ron Paul, who believes in separating the money uh, and not in the United States, not investing in countries, especially when the United States is going through such economical crisis. You know, at least something, something around at least a hundred billion dollars a year spent uh, by the United States on countries, three billion dollars or so in military infrastructure and financial help to Israel, I believe that Israel needs to separate itself financially because, you know, from the from the time of the Second Intifada in the early 2000s, it has always been Israel pandering into the pressure of the United States, pressure of the world to uh, go into a place, do a little bit of damage, and then come right back out because of all the international pressure. And the only way that's going to change is if they don't take money uh, from the United States, as long as they are financially, quote-unquote, dependent on the United States, then um, the United States is going to tell what to do. So what's, I mean, does America, if you're, you're in charge, let's say Rabbi Hoffman, do you just tell Israel, make the jump and cut off ties as far as financially? I mean, how exactly does Israel become independent? I think it has capabilities. It has top businesses and I mean, stuff. What's $3 billion, Ari, in a country that it's is I – mean, It's 30 billion, first of all, not three. It's 30. We can't just get rid of it. I mean, how, do you weave the thing off? How do you do that exactly? $30 billion? It's $30 billion per year approximately. Well, under the Bush That's administration, it's about, it's about the same when you, when you add everything up. Figures. We have to look at those figures. I thought it was much closer in the in the single billions. All right. Well, either way, even if it's th- even if it's three, you can tell uh, you can't just chuck that. So, uh, how exactly do we wean off the United States money if that's the, what we want to do? Well, let's say it's three billion dollars. There are a tremendous amount of scientific, high tech computer, modern advancements that are going on in Israel that are making a lot of money very quietly. There are business ties between the state of Israel and China, Japan, Singapore, Canada, a lot of export opportunity. I don't understand uh, so much the the financial dependence on the United States anymore. Again, especially at a time when the United States is dealing with its own issues at home. Well, that's another thing. I mean, you talked about the United States police the world. I mean, this is, again, how our show is about – is a prophecy about the final war Michelle coming, et cetera, because it seems this whole domino effect that the United States for the last 15 years, even 20 years, I mean, really go longer, but more in the last 10, 15, that they have tried to police the world, and that has really stretched everything thin. It's crippled their economy. And now when it comes to trying to deal with Iran, you can hear the people saying, hey, we learned our lesson from Iraq. We're not going to get involved with this thing anymore. Let us well figure it out. And – is that, a, is that a good thing or a bad thing if, if just Israel will go in by themselves to disarm the Iran nuclear program, as BB okay. said they will? Well, me and you, Ari, are under the same assumption 
that uh, it's not based on connections between Israel and different countries, that it's a connection between Israel and God. In 1967, the United States was not backing Israel. And in a miracle that didn't make any sense, Israel was able to defeat uh, at least a half dozen different Arab countries uh, that were about to uh, basically put all the citizens in the water. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, the, the wars, again, I know it's supposed to be a tad impartial, but to say that they were not miraculous, I mean, that is crazy. You have David McGurn who made that quote to not believe in miracles in Israel. You're not a realist. If you look through the Six-Day War, even in this war, I mean, I spoke with a military intelligence member talking about the Iron Dome, former military intelligence member, and he said, you know, people think the Iron Dome is winning us the war, but there are a lot of miracles going on, even with the Iron Dome in itself. The Iron Dome does not have the capability to stop everything that it has been stopping. You also have had cases where a mortar hit a house, and no one was hurt in the house. And at this point, there have been very few Israeli casualties. There was a elderly woman who passed away of a heart attack. Now, I believe that counts as a casualty. Uh, Israeli government may not fund that family like they should, but to my opinion, that's a casualty. And you also had a Chabad rabbi who sadly passed away on Tuesday. He was delivering food to soldiers, and he was hit. So that is two casualties. Obviously, that is too, too many but when you consider that the terrorists want to wipe out 6 million people in this country to have two casualties, I still consider it miraculous at the end of the day. Oh, there's no doubt this is a miraculous situation. We have stories like the Purim story, where not a single Jew died in battle against tens of thousands, over 100,000 uh, uh, in an army. Uh, that looked to take out the Jews. So what are we going to put more stock in at the end of the day? Now, I know this is not an argument that people can make on a logical level when speaking to members of the international community, but um, I very much believe in God being number one in my book, and I'm not going to put foreign powers like the United States, you know, bigger than God. To me, that's like idol worship. Well, that's you, another thing I like to tell people. When you take more seriously something like a political entity over God, I mean, we're going to throw religion out the window? I don't want to. Well, what about the concept that we have to do our effort? I mean, that's the question, right? What is proper effort? What is not? I mean, we built the we built the Iron Dome. We didn't just sit down and say we're not going to do anything and God will take care of it. We built the Iron Dome. But is, is that it? You wouldn't say that's a mistake. Well, the United States funded the Iron Dome. But again, these are monies that, that and you say it's $30 billion. We've got to take a look because $30 billion is a lot of money. Um, I believe it's closer to the single digits. And um, that that is you know, almost a laziness to rely on another country's amount of money. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we shouldn't be allies, allies similar to how England was allies with the United States in World War II, uh, countries that were aligned with the United States in World War II. You know, still the United States can appreciate having a power in the Middle East, so they say is a democratic best friend that treat women properly, that don't uh, engage in nasty tactics against its people uh, of, you know, in comparison with, you know, the horrible things that happen uh, around the Middle East, the, the extremist Islamic barbarism on a daily basis. Uh, how interesting is it that when times change, all of a sudden, we talked a little bit before about the rhetoric of the United States changing during a time like this. Uh, John Kerry in closed doors talking about Israel as an apartheid state. That's a real slap in the face of Jews and Israelis around the world. Well, um, okay, how about this? What is Kerry's incentive? Why is he saying that? What? I'm sorry, what is Kerry's? Yeah, why, why is Kerry calling it – you said Kerry called it apartheid state, right? Why would he say that? Well, this, this, this kind of talk – started with Jimmy Carter in the early 2000s. I personally was in New York City uh, on 
And when I heard from people running into our classroom at Yeshiva University on 9-11 that the towers had just fell, my first gut, uh, the first thing that came to my gut was the idea of the apartheid talks that were going on in a tribunal African conference right before 9-11, where, and this thing was somewhat headed by Jimmy Carter, these people were of the opinion that Israel was an apartheid government. And for any legitimate historian, this is absolutely absurd. I mean, I can see outside-of-the-box similarities, but the context is ridiculous. And also, just to label uh, Israel as an apartheid government is very disrespectful to Jews, uh, not only to Jews in Israel, but specifically within the United States. You know, something that the United States government does not realize enough is that there are a lot of Jews in the United States that are extremely pro-Israel and extremely religious. So for these things to be said, they are considered borderline anti-Semitic by a large group of Jews in the United States who the government should be more thankful and appreciative towards, especially when it considers Israel to be a best friend, and especially when Jews have been rather instrumental in the success of the United States. Of course, how interesting is it that when we're going through such a recession, the United States is that, uh, and in general, it's natural human psychology to not remember uh, success when dealing with so much misfortune. Well, that is actually a verse from the Torah where Shem talks about, God talks about that when a person's downtrodden, he'll pray. God will help him, and then they'll forget Hashem. So I think that carries over even with people. You know, you someone downtrodden, a person helps them, they get back up, and then they forget that person. I mean, we've seen that time and time again, not just through people, but through countries. So uh, a few minutes we have left on the program uh, with you, Rabbi, as far as this uh, current situation with the Israelis and the Arabs, ground troops going in last night. Tell us what you see happening in the next few days. Also, what should Israel try to accomplish in the next few days. I mean, we hear people saying, hey, we got to finish the job, you got to take out Hamas, but Hamas would then be replaced by another terrorist organization, right? Is that really going to do anything at, that, at this point? Well, is your question to me, what should Israel do or what is Israel going to do? How about what is Israel, what should they do? And we have about two minutes, so uh, please make a brief, Rabbi. What Israel should do is go into Gaza completely uh, demilitarize the community, take all the rockets out, all the people shooting rockets at Israel, take out all the terror tunnels. The problem is, if you had to ask me what's going to happen, it's not that, because as politics has proven, ever since I've been following things in the Middle East from the early 2000s, it seems like every time there's a campaign in a war in Palestinian territories, the Israeli army will go in for a couple days and they will cater into the international pressure and the pressure of the United States do, in my mind, what is a haphazard job. And this will enable the terrorists to get their hands back on everything they need and for there to be a, another war in a year and a half, two years' time. So it's like the world is interested in basically creating a buffer or a period of relief for about a year and a half, and then the same thing will happen. That is a vicious cycle, is it not? It certainly is, and that's why I talked about that at the top of the show, that currently life in Israel is that there is a war every two years. So that's why we wanted you on the program to discuss if this particular war is the final war, Gogobago, which is talked about in Prophecies, talked about in Nevua throughout uh, the generations that there will be a, a final war before Mashiach comes. So the question, of course, if this is the one that escalates it. Rabbi Hoffman from the Raven Institute, thank you for being on Is a Prophecy here on Israel National Radio and messiahhour.blogspot.co.il. Ari, thank you so much for having me on. What a pleasure it is to be on the radio in Israel, in Jerusalem. Have a good one, brother.
You too. And we have about a minute left. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Again, this program will be podcasted in about three hours approximately. Again, messiahour.blogspot.co.il. Any questions you have, you can email us at messiahour at gmail.com. And again, the goal of this show, I'm looking for sponsors. I want to do the show three hours a day, five days a week, get a lot of information out to people. I mean, we just scratched the surface today with Rabbi Hoffman. There's so much to talk about. This is such a huge topic. It's really the most important topic in the world. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Again, messiahhour.blogspot.co.il. And as always, Shabbat Shalom from the Holy Land.